Aloha. Welcome to Finding Your Piece of the Rock on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Abe Lee. I have been a licensed real estate agent since 1973. I'm the owner of Century 21 I Properties Hawaii and work with close to 100 wonderful agents in real estate sales. I started Abe Lee Seminars in 1980. I have taught over 10,000 students to get their real estate licenses and taught continuing education classes for licensees to renew their license every two years. Our show is dedicated to helping buyers and sellers understand the process involved in a real estate transaction. Our special guests will talk about legal issues, escrow, title, getting a loan, and today we're going to talk about surveys and home inspections, insurance, contracts, woods and trusts, and much, much more. So this handsome young man that you see is joining us is Alvin Alimbuyugun, and I can't even pronounce the name correctly, but he'll correct us again. But we're so grateful to have Alvin. He's a second generation surveyor, and I've known his father for decades. So Alvin, thank you for being with us today. No problem. Thank you, Abe. So it's Alvin Olimbu Yogen. Uh, the U is a little silent there. All right. So Alvin, tell us about your life, your family, your education, your background, and your life as a son of a surveyor. Right. So I was born and raised on the island of Oahu. Um, my dad has been, or he's been surveying since 1999 uh, privately. And before that, he was working with the state as a um, surveyor for 10 years. So he's been surveying for over 40 years, about almost 40 years. Um, he was, through his work, he was able to send me to uh, Midpac, where I graduated from in 2008, and then um, also pay for my college education. And uh, I was able to graduate from UH um, in five years, where I graduated in civil engineering and then okay. um yeah and so sorry go ahead <laughs> tell us more all right yeah so my mom has also been part of the business for the last 25 years helping my dad with the uh emails and stuff so she's also corresponded with Abe a lot so that's how we know each other well your mom Lilia is one of my students and oh, also has too. her yeah, license she, with us yeah. <laughs> so we recently got her real estate license yeah, too. yeah that's yeah. correct great so tell me, Alvin, how did you get started and why did you become interested in becoming a surveyor? So the first couple of years of college, I just didn't know, a lot, like a lot of kids, I don't know what to do. I was just, you know, going through life, navigating it. And um, I was, I've always helped my dad, uh, whether it be in the office or going out in the field. So um Probably the last two years of college, I was getting more into surveying with him, and then I was going out more often um, with him in the field and just learning more and more. And you know, I'm not bad at this. This is not bad. Um, Some, you know, initially I didn't really care to actually look into it because it's like I don't want to do what my dad does. I don't know why. I just wanted to do whatever you know I wanted to do, but I was just figuring that out still. And um, just thinking about long life plan and stuff, this is this was the route that I decided is best for me and my family. Great. So tell me, what's the educational and experience requirements to be a surveyor? Because a lot of people don't know what's required to be a surveyor. It's not easy work. Right. So either you can go through four years of uh, college and then you can take your um, your uh, fundamentals of surveying exam. And then once you finish your fundamentals, you can take your professional surveying um, license. So the fundamentals first, and then usually it's two, uh, two years of experience under a licensed surveyor. And then you could take your uh, professional license. And then you have to take your state exam to finalize that license. So it's either that or go through 11 years of experience before you can take your fundamentals exam again, if you didn't go to college. So if you didn't go to college, 11 years of experience. If you do go through college, just two years of experience, and then you can take your professional license. 
and I understand that yeah. professional license test takes like eight hours or something or around there. Um, yeah, so each part, the fundamentals is about eight hours. The professional part is about eight hours. And then the state license is about four hours. Holy macro. <laughs> it's like being a doctor almost, not quite. <laughs> okay. So it does take a lot of work. Now, let me ask you, when we're out on the road driving around, we'll usually see two guys, usually two guys or ladies, and they have this fluorescent vest on and they have these sticks, right? And they're holding it and someone's doing measurements and stuff. Is that typically a surveyor most of the time? Um, yeah, so you usually see someone out with a tripod and then another person holding a rod and there'll be some kind of um, either a GPS or a, uh, we call it um, a prism on top of it. So one person is usually taking notes and shooting whatever the guy with the rod is holding. And then that's how we're able to physically locate all the um, all the measurements and whatever we need, whatever we need to show to uh, finish the survey. Okay. So this, what you're talking about is what they call field notes, like right. degrees, azimuths, feet, minutes, and seconds, which I have no idea what the heck I'm talking about. Yeah, just angles but, and distances pretty much. Okay. And you got to draw that thing with a description. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I've read field notes. I go, holy mackerel, I have no idea what they're doing. I have great respect for surveyors. And there are too many of your surveyors, are there anyway? Um, doesn't feel like it. Uh, I know the average age of a licensed surveyor is around 45 to 50 years old right now. So um, I don't know how interested a lot of younger people are, but it is interesting to try out. And I would encourage other people to go into the land surveying. Okay, so what kind of surveys do you do? What kind of surveys are there? I mean, I understand there's a lot of different kinds of surveys that surveyors can do, but what's your specialty? So we specialize in um, whatever the real estate agent, real estate agents need to uh, complete their contract, which is mostly staking or boundary surveys. Um, besides that, we do uh, shoreline surveys, flood elevation surveys, topographic surveys. And then there's other types of surveys that we, as um, our company typically doesn't do, which is like construction surveys, um, hydrographic surveys. There's all kinds of different types of surveys uh, not done in Hawaii either. Uh, so there's like mining surveyors. There's um, surveyors that just do, do things for uh, locating crime scenes and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you mostly in residential then and commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And when you say topography surveys, you're talking about gradations of elevations on a piece of ground. Yes. So by the time it gets to the architect, they can use the work that we provide them, and then they'll provide you with their um, architectural drawings that show the right elevation, right side elevation, left side elevation, front elevation. So we work together to bring that to the client. And re really for a builder and an architect and gen engineer, you absolutely need a topography survey. <clears throat> um, yes. And then uh, before it wasn't required too much if your land is pretty flat, but uh, now there's a new requirement in Hawaii where even if it's just an ADU, you need a full topographical survey, even, uh, even if it's flat. Oh, wow. So, okay. <laughs> so now what's your main responsibility? So you got field workers that are out there doing the, what I call the, uh, the labor work. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that field notes that your people give you and what's your job in the back? So, um, I actually do everything from the front to the back. Oh, okay. I go out to the field. I work in the office, a little bit of everything, but, um, after we collect the data, whatever information we need in the field. Um, the deliverables are usually a map or an AutoCAD file, which I, like I mentioned, you can send to an architect or, um, the map would be in a PDF where you can see a bird's eye view of what is, uh, what the property looks like. Um, yeah, just from above. Okay, great. So let's say, tell me 
how the process works. Who orders a survey? So typically for a K2 survey, um, the real estate agent or sometimes the homeowner will also come to us and they'll ask for the survey. And then um, we'll look up their deeds. We'll look up whatever file plans, associated land court applications, maps, um, pretty much just to be able to find what their property looks like on paper and mathematically, just with the angles and distances that I we talked about. So we see what it looks like on paper, take it to the field, and then go from there. And then, like I said, we um, we bring it back to the office, and then we get that map. And then in a, for K two, there's a report that goes along with that map that shows encroachments, and you can see. Uh, hopefully, it's described clearly enough by us. Uh, where certain improvements are along the boundary line if they're crossing into your neighbor or you're crossing into the other neighbor and so on and so forth. Okay. We're going to talk about de minimis distances in a little while, but how long does it take from the time you get an order from somebody to say, hey, can you uh, do the survey? And then how long does it take for you to get to the field do the report and then bring it back and do the drawings and certify or you know do the final documentation. Right. So it really depends on the lot because not all lots are made the same. Nothing is um nothing's a perfect square all the time. You have some lots out in um Kaneohe or Waianae or it doesn't matter. All over the island there's a lot of irregular looking lots. So um the more irregular it is, the harder it is for us. But um, it's all part of the job. Um, yeah. So what do you think? Uh, uh, typical work, a couple of weeks? Oh, right. So um, I would say after, after we get the request, probably spend um, a day or so going over the notes and finding all the documents we need, and then another day for the field work. Um, hopefully not the full day, so we could squeeze in a couple jobs on one day. Um, like I said, depending on the lot. And then uh, usually two to three days for our uh, map and report to come out. But if it's a bigger job than the K2, so if it's a topographic survey and Alta survey or something bigger, it's usually uh, two, two to three weeks after. Okay. So you really can't rush because you have your appointments booked. So it's not like you can yeah. drop something and go, okay, we can do it tomorrow morning. Because I know Jamie's done that on weekends for me because yeah. I'm a regular customer, but he yeah. usually doesn't do that. He just does yeah. it in sequence unless I yeah. beg him. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we usually, uh, we're usually booked two to three weeks ahead. Mm. Um, but we, we try to accommodate everyone that comes to us. But sometimes... Um, Sometimes everything's really rushed, and we would prefer not to rush, especially when you're dealing with uh, something, you know, so much legalities involved, right? Sure. You don't want to. You don't want to mess up. So the difference between like this. yeah, you bet. So the difference between a K one survey and a K two survey that we see in the purchase contract is a K one is you're just putting in pins, four, five, so that's whatever. Usually faster. Yeah. yeah. But the K two survey, you have two things going right? You have the map itself and you're showing the encroachments, encroacher or encroachee. And then you have a, a, what do you call it? A narrative saying, okay, point A has this, point B has this, and point C has this. So that's a lot more complicated and detailed, isn't it? Yes. So yeah, from the, just the staking, it takes a little bit more time. So the staking would pretty much be done the day of and then we would double check it in the office and send a uh, send a certificate or a letter certifying that it was staked. Okay, but most uh, properties with homes, they usually do a K two survey rather than a K one survey. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so it takes a little more time, and of course, it's a little more expensive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Now. Um, What's an encroachment? So um, an encroachment is uh, just the measurement that would be over your property line. So if uh, if let's say I have a rock wall 
that I built what I thought was our bound along what I thought was my boundary line. Um, the world's not perfect and I might, and contractors aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. So we might just build, you know, an inch or two over. So um, in our report, it would, it might show how much feet like 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, half a foot over the boundary line, the wall actually is. And then it's not considered an encroachment in Hawaii unless it's um, over six inches, half a foot. Okay, so let's go over that. They call it de minimis structure discrepancy or something. So if it's residential, it's a half a foot. Right. So people can't get them mistaken because it's not 0.6 feet, it's 0.5 feet, which is six right. inches. Correct. Right? Correct. Yes. Now, if it's apartment, uh, industrial business resort, then the allowable tolerance is what a foot is it? 0.25, I believe. Okay, 0.25 feet. And then how about for if it's um, agricultural or rural areas, I believe it's 0.75 feet. Um, I think you're correct on that. Okay. And then conservation land is usually one and a half feet, is what I've been told. Um, we don't work too much on conservation, so I'll have to double check on that one. You okay. might know more about that than me, but <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, I'll take just so you know, it. I teach yeah. this stuff in my classes every yeah. um, month. So, but you deal mostly with residential, so it's half a foot, right? Yeah. So, if the encroaching wall or fence is less than 0.5 feet or six inches, then the law says it's not deemed to be an encroachment. Is that correct? Um, it's still, it, technically, it is still an encroachment in our eyes, but right. to the law, you don't need an encroachment agreement written on it. It does not need to be uh, reported, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. But you pointed out, like, it's 0.5 feet yes. or, so whenever we see a report from a surveyor, we're always looking for 0.5 feet or less. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if it's point more, then oh, we may have to get an encroachment yeah. agreement, whatever, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now, um, what's an ALTA survey versus a regular survey? Um, so that's for the American Land Title Association. And so um, for residential lots, usually they, they won't ask for an ALTA. Mostly commercial lots will ask for an ALTA. Um, that's just up to the uh, title company to decide whether they want it or not. and then. That usually involves locating everything, including the perimeter. So we'll show encroachments, but we'll locate everything else, including the house, the roof lines, um, anything, anything visible, all utilities, the sidewalks, um, overhead wires, everything, everything. <laughs> so that takes more money then. Yeah, those are typically a little bit more expensive. Okay, because I've rarely done ultra surveys except for commercial lenders yeah usually they'll want it yeah but you know if some people say we don't need alter survey just give us a regular one but yeah. so there's the alter survey which is more for commercial properties and mm -hmm. then of course the regular survey which what we call the k2 survey for what would i call residences then yeah right okay so now uh how do you know like if you see a wall or fence typically that's what's encroaching most of the time but mm -hmm. How do you know whose wall it is when sometimes it crosses over from one side to the other? Um, so sometimes we'll ask the owners if they both know, um, if we're unsure. But what's a giveaway for us is usually how the fence um, corners or angles. If, if uh, a fence usually isn't made like just straight on one property, sometimes it'll usually connect to a gate or something. That'll be some kind of identifier for us that um, to us looks kind of obvious that it's made by one side versus the other. So we look for those kinds of things like the corners and the angles of it. Okay. So that's kind of almost a judgmental call based on what you see as right. to who has the bulk of that wall. You know, is it right. one side or the other side? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you do when the lot is really steep? Because I've asked your father to do a survey. He goes, hey, too dangerous. We're not going. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, we'll recommend some other bigger companies. There's a, there are bigger companies that have um, more uh, better technology than we do. Our, our uh, instruments are usually reliant on line of sight. So there are drone surveys and um, things of that nature. But if we can't physically send someone down there, then we'll typically put a point along the boundary line and then the map that accompanies our survey is going to show how far back the actual line goes down a hill or something. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, when we look down, there's usually, and it's if it's un unaccessible, it's usually on a lot that um, there's no one on the other side. So we pretty much know that uh, no one's encroaching or have built anything over there. Okay. So. What happens when two surveyors, one did one survey on one end and the other did the survey on the other side, and sometimes it, they cross over, but sometimes they don't match. So what happens when two surveys don't exactly close out, as they say? What do you do with the other surveyor? Um, so typically, we'll talk to the other surveyor first because um, they'll have done their homework, and then we'll have done our homework, and we'll compare notes and um, sometimes surveying is an exact science. We can see that the math says exactly 50 feet, but the world isn't perfect. And what we find on the ground and what we see with the walls and how the walls measure up and everything, it's not exactly 50 feet. So somewhere along the lines, um, people just didn't really get surveys and built, um, built their walls wherever they, you know, they thought the lines were, and then that's what usually causes the problems. And then you can see, oh, the frontage here is, uh, they're short, they're short a foot, they're short half a foot or something like that. So we'll compare notes with the other surveyor and then we'll, we might change our decision or the other surveyor might change their decision depending on how convincing we are to each other. Or we'll just agree that, you know, at the point where it comes together, there is a, there is a, you know, there's a, some discrepancy there. And um, if someone did a survey coming from one side versus someone did a survey coming from the other side, it's just, there's a problem in that area. And uh, that's where, that's where the problem meets. And <laughs> sometimes the pins don't match up. That's just, well, there's nothing really we could do more yeah. for that. I asked a surveyor who was a state surveyor and he was my neighbor in Manoa and old timer. So he retired from the state and then went to private practice with a you know, local engineering firm. So I asked him one day, I said, Kazu, how come you guys say approximate or about? And he made a really classic point, which you said was serving is an art and not a science. So historically, how did they measure in the old days, before GPS and before you know drones or whatever, um, yeah. So before, before they used chains, and um, they would each chain would be like sixty six feet in length, and then they would know the length of the chain, and they yeah. would they would be accompanied with a compass, uh, which is a magnetic compass. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong there. Um, length of the chain can shorten or lengthen. Um, depending on the temperatures, you know, um, if you're close to something magnetic, your compass could be thrown off a little bit. So there's all these factors before that um, that don't aren't really a factor now with the technology that we have, but could cause problems, you know, down the line to where we have to survey it now. So really, surveying in the beginning was two guys with a chain, they pull, and then they measure. Right, yeah. And I always say if they're in the morning, they're strong, it's tighter. But if they're <laughs> tired at the end of the day, it might be looser. And that's why they say about or approximately in their description. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, well, for us too, it's because our measurements, um, for example, would be 0.53 for an encroachment. Mm. But we say approximately 0.5 because we're going to only the 10th. But we uh, could, could actually measure to the hundreds. So that's okay. where we say approximate for us. All right. So technology-wise, 
it's a much more finer science now than it used to be when you had two guys with a chain. Correct. Okay. So people have to understand that surveying may not be exact. It might not be exactly 5,000 square feet. Approximately is what they say, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So we have a few minutes left. Um, what's an unusual thing that you found in your surveying that was kind of different? And yet you have to resolve the issue or you have to solve the problem? Um, so the biggest problem for us is when um, deeds were written, uh, deeds were written in Hawaiian before, mm -hmm. and then they've been interpreted in um, English. And then we'd had to actually transfer some of the uh, units from chains to feet and everything like that. So um, the problems now is sometimes a lot doesn't close or it doesn't mathematically, let's say it's supposed to be 50, 50 by 50 by 50, like a perfect square. You know, um, but by the time it gets, by the time we read it now, and by the time we get to the lot, it's actually, you know, 60 by 50 by 60 or something. It's just, everything's just kind of off. And then we kind of have to, <laughs> we have to see how to deal with that from each, each lot is, uh, you know, it, its own, its own entity. So <laughs> we have to figure it out individually for each lot, what the problem is. Wow. I give surveyors a lot of credit because when you do the meets and bounds and degrees, feet, minutes, and seconds, I have no idea what the heck I'm reading. And I'm so grateful that there are guys like you and your father and others that have been in surveying for quite a few years. Um, so th Alvin, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and your insight into the surveying world. Because a lot of people don't really understand what a surveyor does. Yeah. You know? So I give you credit. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you folks for watching. And I hope you learned some new things today on our Think Tech Hawaii show. And our guest is Alvin Alimbuigun and a surveyor, licensed surveyor, and an engineering graduate from University of Hawaii. So if you want to see the show or more or tell your friends about it, Think Tech Hawaii has an archive of all the shows that we've done. And certainly tell your friends about it. And please, we'd love to have you watch our other shows that we've had with different guests. So thank you very much. And we appreciate you watching. And we'll see you on the next session of Finding Your Piece of the Rock. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.